So we are here to discuss um, guilt, regret, karma, creating positive futures. Is there anything that's not in that list? I mean, if you're here for the weight loss program, you've come on the wrong night. That's, <laughs> I can't help you with that, but I can help you with removing the things from your shoulders that might be weighing you down. But I can't, I can't make you more fit, at least not tonight. So I want to start by talking about guilt. In fact, before I talk about guilt, I just want to give a bit of a, um, an introduction. And that is that a lot of the problems that we have are in our mind. They're in our mind. And because they're in our mind, they're real. Because our reality is defined by our mind. If it's in the mind, then we have to go to an area of seichel, an area of intellect, in order to learn how to better use our mind. Because it's not actually something that we get taught very much. At least, not when I went to school. I was told to use my mind. I was told to remember things. I was even told to apply things. But no one ever taught me how to use my mind. No one told me that my mind is there to play tricks on me. And no, nobody told me that my mind in the subconscious and the superconsciousness were even more powerful than my consciousness. And then my consciousness was like after the equal sign. So you know one plus one equals two? So two is your mind, but what's the one? What's the plus? What's the other one? What's all this background information? And so we just kind of roll through life, experiencing life as we are. And the truth is there's a lot more to our superficial experience. And we're constantly processing information and we're not thinking about it. And yet that information that we're processing is constantly um, using energy. Not only is it using energy, but it's also uh, picking us up and pulling us down. Guilt is one of those things. What is guilt? So very simply, very simply, Let's say you do something, and then you come to realize after the fact that that was a stupid thing to do. Stupid, wrong, whatever, whatever description you want to give it. So you experience this wave of guilt. It's this feeling of, of, of knowing that you've done something wrong, knowing that you've done something wrong, and the subsequent feeling that goes along with it. It might lead to regret, but guilt and regret are not the same things. So you might experience regret if you've got a conscience or you've got some value system. So then you're going to move into regret. But the guilt is this feeling that you experience upon the realization that you have erred. Now, it doesn't mean uh, all sorts of... I'm not going to give examples. Does everyone here, has everyone here experienced guilt because surely I don't need to give examples. Let's just make sure everyone is normal here. Everyone's felt guilt? Just raise your hand if you have felt guilt. Raise your hand if you have never felt guilt. Because you're going to have no idea what I'm on about for the first 25 minutes. I also question your Jewish genealogy. <laughs> if you haven't experienced guilt. With all the studies in, in epigenetics, I'm starting to believe that guilt is really something we do transfer from one generation to the next. And that... If you look into the Jewish DNA, you will find there is the guilt gene. <laughs> and it's got layers of like this fat which preserves and protects it to make sure that in case there's a proverbially cold winter that's going to come and starve the body, guilt will not die. It has plenty to feed off. So that is, that is a, an interesting difference between the Jewish genes and, and other genes. It's one of the ways that People know that they're Jewish because of that guilt gene. So, guilt. We do something, we realize that it was wrong, or we realize that we were wrong, and uh, it may play into regret. Who here has ever experienced regret? So, regret is a very... Yep, yep, good, good, still with us. I noticed not everyone's hands went up for that question. Interesting. I'm glad I'm not sitting next to you. Um, but regret is a very interesting idea because regret is already um, judging the, the, the action, judging what happened, and now you wish you could take it back or, or you feel it was really such a, a bad thing. 
These are feelings. These are not thoughts. These are feelings that may trigger thoughts. So there are two ways to think and there are two ways to feel. In uh, Kabbalah, there, there are two dynamics. There is thinking as a result of feeling, and then there is feeling as a result of thinking. So let me give you an example of thinking as a result of feeling. I'll use a negative, if that's okay, because negative's always more fun. Let's say you have an illicit relationship with someone. So that is a relationship that's born out of feelings. You felt, and it may be even less than feeling, it may be impulse. There were these processes of impulses and feelings, and then you need thinking in order to work your way through it. So justification for why it's okay to feel this, justification as to why the relationship should go on, or justification for the behavior that was. But all that behavior and everything that took place was a result of an emotional experience. It wasn't the result of an intellectual experience. So that is feeling, that is thinking as a result of feeling. So another example, you eat one too many pieces of chocolate cake. You felt it, now you rationalize. Well, I'm anyway going to be doing exercise tomorrow. Or I anyway had a big workout today. You start going through an intellectual process to, to justify or to explain or to work with the feelings. But if you didn't have that feeling and impulse, you wouldn't be having any of these thoughts. Correct? Good. Then you have feeling as a result of thinking. For example, someone explains to you, um, someone explains to you that in um, St Kilda there are battered women who have been raped and uh, they've fallen through the cracks of the system and there's nobody there to look after them. They don't really send to link. It just doesn't work. There's a much larger systemic issue that, that needs to be addressed. And you think about it. And now you know about it. And now you experience sadness. Now you experience feelings towards these people. As a result of give, being given data, and as a result of your brain working, you now have an emotional response. Now you'll say the same thing happens when you, uh, when you uh, if you're having an, uh, an illicit relationship, there was data, but that data wasn't being intellectually processed. It was being subconsciously processed. So over here I'm talking about where I give you something, you think about it, you go through it, so you might go, well, why are they in this position? And then you conclude and you go, oh, I feel terrible about their scenario. So there's thinking and then feeling. It goes further. Let's say you have a relationship you're in a marriage, long-term relationship, and after 25 years, after 30 years, you're kind of through with it. It's not uncommon. It happens particularly after people, um, after the last child has moved out of the house and couples have to spend time together, there's suddenly like, I, I don't know you. <laughs> I, don't I remember meeting you 20, 35 odd years ago, but... That was years ago. Who are you? Well, I'm the person that's been looking after the child. Yeah, you've done a great job, but why are you still around? It's like there, and there has to be this reintegration. The relationship has to be reinvested in. There, there has to be this new process of understanding and appreciating and, and visualizing and, 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 and loving this person until eventually you get an emotional response. Love. So here we see that what is that love? That love is born out of thinking in that it's, it's, it's chagas, it's emotions born out of seichel. I don't mean thinking necessarily that you sat there horroring and thinking. I'm just saying there has to be an intellectual process and then there is an emotional response. So here we see two things. What happens with guilt, what happens with guilt is you think about it Oh my gosh, what did I do? And then there is the emotion that comes after that. And there are people that live with this emotion sitting right here on their shoulders for the rest of their lives because they've got this guilt and the guilt drives them into what everything does. What does a feeling then drive you into? It drives you into an impulse. I need to act on it. The problem is it's in the past. What are you going to do? If you did something that is irreversible and everything is irreversible, what are you going to do? 
Now, let's say you stole fifty dollars when you were in year seven. When you in year seven, you stole fifty dollars from someone, and in year eight, and you're experiencing guilt, so you you, you pay them back the fifty dollars. I'm sorry, you don't know. I took this fifty dollars from you, so I, you give them the fifty dollars. You can't take back the past, but at least you can rectify in that you can buy off your guilt. Nothing bad anymore. I've closed the, the circuit. We're going to talk about that shortly. But most guilt think, guilt, guilty experiences and feelings that we have in life are not ones that you can buy off, which is why they weigh on us, because there's nothing we can do about it. Or there is something we can do about it, but we don't want to do anything about it because it's too hard. So it's almost like, I don't want to live with the guilt, but I don't want to live with working on it. So I'm going to have to carry the guilt. And that guilt then translates into all sorts of physical ailments. Stress, headaches, heart palpitations, insomnia, and all that. So we have the thought, I did something wrong, the feeling that goes along with it, and the impulse or the lack of behavior there's no impulse. There's no the, the impulse, but then the hesitancy to act on the impulse. And so people think guilt is a part of life. You're just going to have to live with it. You're going to have to suck it up and live with it. But if I said guilt is actually a part, if I said guilt is a part of your thinking, well, then hang on, it is a result of your thinking. Change your thinking, you can remove guilt. And that's what I'm here to do with you tonight. I'm here to re- help you remove the guilt. Regret. Regret is not a bad thing. Regret is only a bad thing if it's, mixed, if it's coupled with guilt and then you've got this new reality. I feel guilty and I regret it. But you know full well that regret doesn't clean your slate and now I've got to live with the guilt and knowing that this is now a part of me. This is a part of who I am. And so regret and guilt often get brought together. And I'm not going to really go into the, the differences and the commonalities, but you can see how it plays in. But regret doesn't have to be enmeshed with guilt. Regret could be, I felt guilty, I regretted it, so now I'm going to act on it. I'm going to change it. Before we talk about changing, let's talk about the feeling of changing. So have you ever um, been in a situation where you did something wrong and now it's in the past and you wish you could go back in time and take it back? Or you wish you could go back in time and fix it? The most common time that this happens is after death. That you wrong someone, they die, and with that comes the closure of the opportunity to possibly rectify it. Or... Everyone's grown up. So let's say you did something to someone when you were in school, but now you're in your 40s. It's, it's so far in the past, the door is closed. What, you're going to call them and say, oh, in year 10, I did this to you. It means nothing to them. It was, it was, it was massive in year 10. It's not massive now. But the everlasting impact of the trauma, that exists. But your admission isn't going to do anything, so you don't do anything. The door is closed. Raise your hand if, if you have been in a situation where you realized the door was closed and, and you wanted to go back and it just wasn't available to go back. Just raise your hand if that's you. Good, good. So we're still talking to the majority. I'll take it that those who didn't put their hand up um, just didn't want to put their hand up as opposed to that doesn't apply. Good. It's a great question. So you're trying to rectify it, but they're not letting you rectify it. Okay, so we're going to come to that as well. So I just want to talk about, when we talk about this uh, desire to change, is it coming from a healthy place or is it coming from an unhealthy place? An unhealthy place, and that's not a question. I'm going to explain those two positions because they can come from either or. An unhealthy place would be that you are trying to do the supernatural. I want to wind the clock back. I want to change it. I wish I could take it back. And I'm living with this wish I could take it back to the point that I actually believe that somehow I could. And because you come to the reality and the realization that you can't, you've got this this torn feeling. I want to. I believe I can. It should be my divine right to, but I can't. And so you've got this inattention. 
that's a very unhealthy form of wanting to change. Because you can't. What you're really saying is, I want to control the situation. I want to be God. I want to be in the past. I want to be in the present. I want to be in the future. I want to be able to time travel and constantly correct. I want to correct things. But you can't. And so we live with this belief that we can. People actually believe that they can. We all do it. And then we accept that we can't. But we don't let go of the belief that we can. Or in different words, we don't lose the desire to go back. But it's a silly thing to be spending time on. Who desires something that's impossible? I desire to fly. I can't fly. Get over it. Stop desiring it. You're wasting time and energy desiring something that's impossible. My body cannot fly. I want to fly. I can go in an airplane. But that's not what I'm talking about. I can't fly. And yet we spend so much time. How much time have you spent saying to people, oh, I wish I could just go back. Or when I say talking to people, you could be talking to yourself. I wish I could go back. Stop saying these stupid and Irish things. You can't go back. And yet we do. We spend days, months, years fantasizing, if only I wish I could. You tell everyone, you shout from the rooftops, I regret it. I wish I could go back. I wish if I could have my day again, if I could just do this. Stop talking about it. All those words being wasted, all that time being wasted, all that emotion being expended into such conversation. Think about it from a seichel, from a logical point of view. How much time have we spent wishing the impossible. Now, if I was one of these fuzzy new age, um, short inspirational videos, I'd say, well, you can't. So don't waste time. I love these inspirational things that tell me what to do, but don't tell me how to do it. And then I have to go, it's right. It's right. They're wise. They're not wise. Tell me how to. That's what I'm here to do tonight. I'm going to be wise. (laughs) Then there is the other desire of I want to change it. The positive version of I want to change it is I want to change it. Not I wish I could go back. Maybe I wish I could change it. But not by going in the past, by by changing it going forward. By changing it going forward. Now someone who wishes to go back in the past at this point will be logging off from what I'm saying because they say, oh, I thought you were going to teach me some secret to time travel. I don't want to change it in the future. I want to change it in the past. And there are a number of reasons why that is. Either there's deep-seated subconscious who knows what, or it could be I don't really want to change it in the present because that's hard work. It would be a lot easier to just rub it out in the past. It's easier to hold on to the impossible but wish for it and demonstrate that I'm really a good person wishing I could take it back rather than actually rolling up my sleeves and taking care of it today because I don't want to be confronted with it today. There are all sorts of things. I'm not saying anyone is any of these, but I'm just trying to break it apart so you can start thinking about in your head. Which one am I? Am I wishing I could go back in the past? Or do I want to fix it going forward? Or do I say I want to fix it going forward, but I want to really just rub it out? I don't want to address that. Just, just distill it in your mind. So let's introduce the idea of karma, because people are very worried. Who, does anyone here worry about karma, that they've created bad karma? Or do they ever wish someone had bad karma? Like, ah, I saw that happen, and then you just, that's it. The rest of your life is sitting with a pair of binoculars watching the karma bus. For those of you who follow 3AW football, you know about the karma bus. The karma bus is like when something bad happens, and then boom, someone gets knocked over. The karma bus came and collected them. So, if, of course, if you're not into football, I haven't got another metaphor. But, 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 but you've either, you're either worried about karma or, you, or some people here, they don't actually believe in karma, but they do wish that karma was real when it comes to other people or when they do something good. So, so this whole idea of karma is something that keeps a lot of people up at night. How do I know? Because I get some pretty strange SMSs at night. I very rarely will get someone SMSing me one o'clock in the afternoon, Menachem, I'm a bit afraid of karma, can, can I give you a call? It's usually around 9.30 at night that, that such things begin. Been thinking about this all day, you got a moment for a chat. Yeah, sure, 9.30, perfect time to chat. It's not like I have anything else to do. Sorry kids, someone's got a karma issue, I'll be right back. And that's because 
the, we live a life of distraction and it's only when we get home at night and we're in the silence of our own home that the thoughts start bubbling up. So I understand that's why these messages happen at 9.30 at night. But what is karma? I'm not going to go into the different religions that have karmic ideas. I just want to talk about the stereotype understanding of karma from a little bit of research, nothing major but accurate enough. It's the understanding that there is some sort of finite reality. The finite reality is completely made up of stuff, energy, whatever. So I'll give you an example. There's myself, there are the glass boys, there is the table in between. So if I said there's the glasses and uh, that's their name, that there are the glasses and there's me, I'd say, is there anything between us? You'd go, Actually, no, the way the room's set up, there's nothing between us. Some of you might be cute and say, well, there's a table between them. But it's not true. There's a lot of air between us. There's a lot of stuff between us. From the tip of my nose to the tip of their nose, there is heaps of stuff. So much so that I, they can hear me talk. My sound waves are able to move through this stuff. There are vibrations that can move. Light is traveling. There's enough stuff that it's easily measurable with the naked eye and with the ears to be able to realize there is stuff between us. There is an atmosphere of stuff between us. And then you go to space, you go, well, between planets there's nothing because there's just space. No, space is stuff. It's just not measurable stuff. Or maybe it is measurable. I don't know. Talk to a physicist. But there's stuff. You can't say it's nothing. It's not folding on itself. It's not collapsing on itself. There's something there. The something is nothing. It's something that maybe can or can't be put in a bottle, but it's something. So there is stuff. And so the karmic system is that because there is stuff everywhere, stuff, I don't mean just tables, but everything, there is energy in everything. When you do something, it creates a wave. And the wave is now in motion. The, and, it's, and it's moving and you've created an energy and that energy is going to, come, going to come back and it's going to define your reality. Not only is it going to come back, but it is an energy that now surrounds you. You have put it in motion and it's a part of who you are and everything that you do creates good karma and bad karma. Good karma is going to give you positive momentum. Bad karma is going to do negative stuff to you. We don't have this idea as concretely found in Judaism. We do create waves. There is the concept of midah connected midah. One thing leads to another thing. One, uh, uh, that one energy does um, lead to another energy, positively and negatively. But we are not bound to the law of midah connected midah. It is just a statement of how some things work. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Middle connected middle. You do something in the natural order, it's going to lead to another thing. And if it's got a negative um, uh, property, it will lead to another. To, to, it will lead to something which has a negative property. But not that that is a rule that that's it. It's finite. It's in place. But rather, that's what will happen in a in a non-conscious reality. But because we don't believe in the finite reality, we believe in an infinite reality of which the finite is an aspect of the infinite, whatever that statement means. I know based on logic that statement shouldn't hold, but this is a finite reality within an infinite. There is not only a finite amount of energy, there is an infinite amount of energy. There is the or ein sof, the infinite light, the infinite energy. If I can do something to draw the infinite into the finite, then it will completely change the finite reality. If I'm not playing just by the rules of this game, then I've got other rules. You don't like these rules? Don't worry. I've got other rules. Which means that if you can do something that somehow brings the Oren Sof into your life, then don't worry about anything that's happened in in your past. Don't worry about anything happening because you can completely erase it. As in you can erase the negative energy. How do you, how is one mamshich orensof? How does one draw down the infinite? Through specific behaviors. Specific behaviors, specific ways of conducting oneself with intention. We call these behaviors mitzvot, and we call these intentions kavanot. I know what you're thinking. Mitzvot as in commandments? Did you, did you really just try to swindle us with some commandments? No. 
I mean mitzvot as in connections. There are 613 connections, 613 different ways of connecting with physical objects with an intention. And then there are who knows how many kavanot, who knows how many um, intentions that one is to have at the point of interaction. And when one does something with the correct intention, with the correct spiritual intention, they draw down through the consciousness of their mind, they draw down something that, uh, uh, they draw down, sorry, they draw down through the consciousness of their mind, they draw down um, the infinite energy. How is a person able to do that? Not because the person is a, is a boss of a dom, not because a person is, is that of mind, fl flesh and blood, but rather because a person is a soul, and although a soul is a finite reality, within the essence of the soul is an infinite quality which allows the soul to actually be a part of the infinite, which, which if I can use my intention to get to that infinite aspect of my soul, then I can draw infinite energy. Infinite energy completely drowns finite rules. In fact, the finite doesn't even exist in the presence of the infinite. And therefore, if I can draw that new energy into my reality, then whatever energy I've created in the past does not exist. Does not exist. There is no reason to be afraid of karma. You're scared of karma? Change the reality. Not introduce positive energy and let them fight. It's like Stephen Wright, who was a childhood comedian that I really loved. So he once said that he put a humidifier and a dehumidifier in the same room and decided to let them fight it out. So it's not you do a bad thing, now do a good thing, let the two fight it out. Draw new energy in, new game. New game. There's no old energy. It's gone. New reality. So how do I do that? Well, I spoke about mitzvot. But before we start getting into mitzvot, we have to still go back to charota, the regret that we spoke about, because regret is a good thing. You can't just like kill people and then go, ah, I'll quickly do a mitzvah, I'll bring a bit of Ein Sof and all's good. Plus, we see full well that there are people that bring the Ein Sof and they still end up going to prison. So they didn't really clear it all up. So first we have to talk about acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance is a very, very dangerous thing. I know it's very, very popular. Lots of people are doing acceptance meditation, and that's a good thing. We need more of that in today's world to be able to accept. But it's dangerous if it's being done without a guide, without someone to mentor you and guide you, because otherwise you could start accepting all sorts of stuff that you shouldn't be accepting. So like uh, uh, if you're being constantly picked on, you do this acceptance meditation... So you can keep being picked on. It's not the appropriate time. There's a time for action, and there's a time to pause. Ace shalom ve ace milchama. There's a time for peace, and there's a time for war. It's what the prophet says. So you can't just do loving kindness meditation. You can't just do acceptance meditation. You can't just meditate, whip out whatever popular meditation is to try to solve problems. What a mentor does is a mentor helps us know, is this a time, to, should I be practicing acceptance or should I be practicing proactivity? After the fact, after someone does something, after we have done something or not done something, but the moment to change the reality is gone, we have to practice acceptance meditation. Acceptance is to accept that what is, is, and there is nothing I can do about it. It's very hard. It's going to be haunting. Now I've got to live with it. So there's a little aspect that we need to introduce. It's called Hashkacha Pratit. Hashkacha Pratit is divine providence. Divine providence, if you actually think about it, it's two really weird words. Divine, not a common word. Providence. Sounds like a TV show. Like, you know, sometimes you use these words so frequently you forget how odd they sound. Divine providence is the concept that everything happens because it's meant to happen and it happens at the time that it is meant to happen. And so the only question that people sometimes have is, why me? It, if it's now in the past, it was always meant to happen. Hashkacha Pratis is about accepting that what happened was always meant to happen. And all you did was you witnessed it. Even if you were the protagonist, you witnessed it. You watched it happen. 
from the best seat in the house as the protagonist. But Ashkacha Pratis is accepting that what is, is. Good, bad, beautiful, ugly, what is, is. I'll give you a good example. Someone gets married, then they get divorced. Does that mean they never should have got married? Chas v'sholem. God forbid. No, I'll say such a thing. They were meant to get married. They were also meant to get divorced. Why? I don't know. But generally when we advertise lectures with the question why, people pack in. They're so gullible. And this time, this time we really, we've done our research. We don't know why, but I can give you a shallow why. It's not the why does it happen, but I can explain why it has to happen. Notice that little thing? There is a concept called reincarnation. Gilgul Anefesh. Gilgul Anefesh, the reincarnation from the Hebrew word Galgal, like a wheel, the cycle. Gilgul Anefesh, reincarnation of the soul, is that the soul has to come into the world. The question is, why does a soul have to be born into the world again? In Pashas Mishpatim in the Zayar, the, the Zayar being uh, the, the works by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, 1,700-odd years ago, he is one of the greatest mystics of all time, one of the greatest sages in the Talmud. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai um, writes in the Zayar on Pashas Mishpatim. Mishpatim is the section of the Torah that talks about interpersonal law, societal law, nothing mystical or spiritual there. But he talks about that reincarnation, and, and the Baal Shem Tov actually really hammers this out, that, um, the reason, that reincarnation happens as a result of interpersonal issues. When we do something wrong to another person and we don't mend or correct or something has to be mended in context of the souls, we get born again in order to relive a life, in order to either create change or to be able to finish something, to service something for another person. No one's ever reincarnated because... Well, not, no, no, I'm not a professional in this. But generally, you're not reincarnated for things that have mystical significance. Mystical significance your soul can take care of um, in, the next, in, in the next reality. But things that require time and space, money, power, and people, you can't take care of that in heaven. There are no people in heaven. There's no money in heaven. There's no time in heaven. There's no before or after in heaven. There just is. So we have to come back into the dimension of time and space, power and money in order to deal with things that we've done wrong. That's one reason for reincarnation. Another reason for reincarnation is that we've got unfinished business. I lived a life, I did as many things as I could, but my soul needs to achieve more in this world. So it has to come back. Another reason that I might be reincarnated is because my partner needs support and I have to be, in, as the soulmate of my partner, I need to be in this world in order to support my soulmate. So just because you're sitting here doesn't mean you did something wrong in the past. Just because you're sitting here doesn't mean that your soulmate needs help. Maybe you're the one and your soulmate's here to help you. Maybe you're here because you're such an amazing soul and there's so much you have to be, get done. Don't think about it because you'll just drive yourself nuts. But what's fascinating about reincarnation is that everyone is born in the time and the place that they are need, needed and that every single person that lives has a contribution to make to the world. Otherwise, the world would cease to exist without that person's contribution. Moreover, that person has particular needs and life is structured in a way that they will come across the opportunity to achieve that which it is that they need to achieve. Whether it is that you wronged someone in a previous life and now you need to re-engage them and you're going to be kind to them in this life. Or whether there is, um, you have a particular aspect to your soul that you can elevate. Uh, uh, simple things. There's water with oranges in, on the table. So if you pour that water now into a cup and you make a bracha on it and you drink it with intention and then you sit here for the rest of the shiur and you listen and learn, then the water hasn't just been witnessing the shiur from the vantage point of the jug, but the water is now in you. It is a part of your consciousness and now the soul of the water is a part of the experience of learning Torah. The water is now a part of the infinite. It is part of the Ein Sof. Now the soul in that water is just sitting there. It's... Please, everyone go nuts. Go swimming. <laughs> that water is right now just sitting there. What's your name? Ronit. Ronit. Except Ronit's cup. The, war, the soul in Ronit's cup is going, oh my God, finally someone. I've been flowing. This water, I've been flowing for how long? 
This water didn't come from nowhere. It didn't come from the tap. It comes from the tap. It comes from the water reservoir, which comes from the dams, which comes from, it comes from rain. It comes from rivers. It comes from the ocean. This water could have well been in cycle for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And now it's about to join Ronit. That'll be the end of its cycle. Just think about it. This water's been doing its rounds for thousands of years and just like that. But how many storms and how much rain and how much evaporation and how much wind and how many rivers and how many reservoirs and how many political campaigns to finally build the water systems to get it to spirit grow on this night so that Ronit could drink it at the time of the shiur. And now the neshama, now the soul of that water, is a, how do we know that wasn't? And this could have been the only reason why you lived life, to get you to this. And now let's think about it. Let's say this is the only thing Ronit ever had to live for. doesn't mean life's over. You've still got plenty of good stuff to do, but this may be the unique interaction that was required. Why did Ronit end up in spirit grow? What nourish stuff is going on in your life that you had to punk come to spirit grow? And what was the cause of all those things? She had to go through school and she had to go through uni and she had to go through this relationship and that relationship and all this just to be able to come to the point of, I have a question, that flyer looks like it might answer it. I'm going to go to that shiur. So everything that has happened in her life is part of the Ashkach el the divine providence for setting her up to come to the shiur, which was never about ever finding answers. It was about drinking the water. So this maybe childish metaphor is a metaphor for divine providence. And everything in the, in the world is like that. Every, everything, there is no such thing as insignificant. There is only sometimes you see the purpose and sometimes you don't see the purpose. But there's no such thing as insignificance. Now, if that's the case, then when something positive or negative happens in your past, it was meant to happen. Now we have to accept that it has happened. We have to accept not only has it happened, but it was God's will. It is the will of the infinite. The whole system has willed this moment, good and bad. How could the system want bad? Not for tonight. No one advertised why do good things happen to bad people and why do bad things happen to good people. That's not tonight's classic class. It's the realization that now that it's in the past, I have to accept that that was always meant to be. That is what Ashkoch HaPratis is. The question is, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to wish? Am I going to wish I could go back? No. Nah. Because that is tantamount to, to idolatry. Or denial of, of meaning and purpose, which is the denial of Hashem. Because either it's, I know what's best, and that shouldn't have happened, I'm going back to fix it. I'm going back in time. That's idolatry. I know best. I am the divine, I am, I am the great sage, I am the God of all, and that shouldn't have happened, so I want to go back, so you're self-worshipping. Or you deny that there is a purpose and meaning, you're, the den you're denying God. When I talk about God, I don't mean the guy with the big white beard that some people go visit on Yom Kippur, the guy with the scale. When I talk about God, I'm talking about the essence of all. I'm talking about the infinite, the meaning of everything, the consciousness of everything, the unification of everything, the everything of the everything, the nothing of the everything, the everything that is nothing, all that. That's what I mean when I say Hashem, when I say God. If I say, no, there is no purpose, there is no meaning, then I'm saying there is no God. No one willed it. No one wanted it. It was never needed. It's all by chance. And if it's all by chance, then what do you get? it's all nonsense. Then what are you getting all caught up with right and wrong? There's no right or wrong if there's no meaning. So don't worry about it. I'm not here to clear anyone's conscience. I'm here to say, now that it's happened, what am I going to do about it? How do I know that this didn't happen now for me to have to react to it? My soul is passing through life and it has to experience positive and negative. Start thinking of yourself in the third person. There was a famous Rebbe, uh, Meryl Premishliner. He used to always talk about Meryl. He wouldn't say I, he'd talk about Meryl. It was almost like he was witnessing his life. Meryl, Meryl does this. Meryl is like, is Meir, but it's the diminutive. Meryl. He was once asked, how does he not fall down when he walks down um, icy, when he walks down icy hills, why doesn't he fall down? Whole story behind this. And he says, because when Meryl is connected above, Meryl doesn't fall below. It was almost like he was witnessing his soul's passage through life. If, so I just want you to think about it. Let's say you've gone through a bad experience or you have been responsible for a bad experience. But now I want you to witness it as a third party. 
Yes. Menachem did that wrong. And then Menachem had these consequences. And then Menachem grew from the experience. There's no pain there. There's no judgment. There's just the observation. It's not something we often do for ourselves. We don't often look at ourselves in, as a third party. We, we, we look at ourselves for ourselves. And we, we're in us. We're very emotionally attached to ourselves. But just think about it. What if that's what it is? What if you think about your soul as a separate entity? You go, the soul had to go through this. Their soul had to go through that. Interesting. But that only brings you to the present moment. The question is now, well, I am my soul, so what am I going to do next? Ah, now we've got action. What is the action? Now that I accept that this is Ashkoch Pratis, and I'm experiencing regret, so I'm left with one thing. I spoke about mind. I spoke about emotion. Now I'm left with impulse. I've got to act on it. I've got to act on it. What do I do? I do what I can do. Not what I can do according to my definition of, of can. I do what I can do based on the options that are available to me. So the Talmud, the Torah, talks about the options that are available to everyone in any situation. We learn from it. We go through character, character refinement. The Baal Shem Tov talks about this. This is called the personal tikkun. This is spoken about a lot in Kabbalah and a lot in, in Hasidism. The personal tikkun, the personal healing, the correction of self. So let's say, let's say you talk ill of another person. You can't take those words back. And the person that you spoke to can't un unhear it. Now that it's been done, I've got to do a few things. Number one, I've got to apologize to the person that I spoke ill about. Number two, I've got to apologize to the person I spoke to. I'm sorry for, 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 for polluting your ears and your mind with my nourish, with my nonsense. I'm sorry so-and-so, you don't know, I spoke negatively about you, can you forgive me? You have to go through the process of asking. This is what Golda was asking. What if they say no? That's why we're doing this class at this time of the year. If they say no, I don't forgive you, the Talmud says you have to go away and you have to go work on yourself. Why didn't they accept my, my, my apology? What is lacking in me? And then when you feel you're ready to try again, you go back to them. You say, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Not how can I make it up to you? Not oh, how can I, which is code for how can I bribe you? How can I make you love me again? Because I need your love. Just I am so sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm supplicating in front of you. Do you accept my apology? If for the second time they say no, the Talmud says you have to go away and you have to meditate and you have to dwell on it and you have to work out why did they say no? What part of my change are they not accepting? And then you, and you work on yourself in this, the character refinement and you eradicate any vestige of this negative behavior within yourself. And then you go back to them and you say, I apologize. Talmud says, if they reject you a third time, it is now their problem, not yours. You are absolved. You are clear. It is not your problem. Now it is their problem. So much so that the original problem that you had is now a part of their reality. It's like you've handballed it. But at this point, you don't feel, you don't care that you've handballed it. You don't, you don't want to wish anything bad on them. You, you just want to eradicate the negativity within yourself. How did I behave like that? So if a person eventually does not accept, does not forgive or accept you, it's not your problem. And if you're struggling with that, then you've got a problem. And the problem is not them. The problem is you. See a psychologist. See a cognitive behavioral therapist. See someone who can help you move beyond yourself. Move beyond the dwelling of some, on something negative, the ruminating thoughts, whatever it is. But if you have truly worked on yourself, it's not your problem anymore. So you, you go through this change the t of, of, as a result of charata. You eradicate it. You change. How do you change? First, you have to understand what you've done wrong. Secondly, you have to speak it out. I did this wrong. Where did it come from? Where's this behavior coming from inside me? And you've got to remove that. And when you have removed that character trait, which, by the way, may, may take a lifetime, which is why we're given so much time in this world, because 
you know, to change yourself is not like you go to a course, I'm a changed person. Generally, people that tell you that they have changed, be very wary of them. They're about to change again. But people who say, I am changing, I'm working on myself, it is a life mission. Hold on to these people. The stamina, the determination, no cheap thrills, no, no, none of that um, shallow. We've got to work on ourselves and, 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 and remove this negative aspect. How was it? When we've done that, then the moment of the past disappears. We shift the karma, or more correctly, we dissolve the karma. I am now white. I am now clean. I am pure. I am white as in the white light. I am all colors. I am back to being uh, um, a conduit for it. That doesn't mean you're not going to go to jail if you've done something wrong. It doesn't mean someone's going to, that people aren't going to ignore you for doing something wrong because that's part of the physical reality. That's got nothing to do with energy. That's the reality. That's the cause and effect, the consequence. Unless. Unless there's one, there is one thing. Because people still fear the future. But the, in the future, the person's going to ignore me. In the future, I'm going to struggle with this. In the future, bad things are going to happen. You wouldn't be alone if you've ever... Have you ever had such thoughts where you're like, my future is very very bad. Why? I've done bad things in the past and my future is bad. And even though you've changed, you still feel like you've got a bad future. It's not going to work out. Or in general, who here ever is a bit of a pessimist? Go for a job interview. It's not going to go well. Why? Why do you go for the job? Why are you going for the job interview if you're so sure? You know? Or I'm going to try this new recipe. It's not going to work. Or I'm going to drive to the airport. I'm going to get every red. I'm going to get stuck in traffic. I figure if I keep telling these, I get more laughs. I know I'm starting to hit the, the I'm starting to hit the money. But if you ever behave like that, you're in good company. You're together with Jacob and Moses, just for examples. Jacob. Jacob is travelling home from his father-in-law's house, Lavon. He's got four wives and a whole lot of kids, heaps of money and cattle, and he finds out that his brother Esau, his long-lost nemesis is coming towards him with a massive army. And so he does three things. He, uh, he, he, he prepares for war. He splits the family into two, and he prays to God. He prepares for war. Good. Prepare for war. Ah, oh, well, goodbye, Facebook. Um, prepare for war. Good. Prepare for war. That's a good thing to do. Separate the family, split it into two, logical. That way if half of them get killed, at least he's got the other half who will survive. And pray to God. You know, he's a mammon, he's a believer. I'm glad he did that. And the commentaries say Jacob was setting himself up for failure. What he should have done was prepared for war and uh, prayed to God that the war was going to go well. Why is he even anticipating, what if half the family gets killed? Bad thoughts, negative thoughts, pessimist, huh? Moses does the same thing. Moses is talking to God at the, at the fiery, uh, at, the, at the burning bush. And God says, hey, go, go free those people. I'm going to teach you a few party tricks. You do that in front of Pharaoh. You do that in front of the Jews. It's going to be great. What does Moses say? After all, he's like, nah, you got the wrong guy. I'm just a shepherd. I'm a this, I'm a that. I've got a speech impediment. I don't want to. I've run away from trauma. You picked the wrong guy. I'm 80 years old. Please let me live in the desert. I'm happy. After we get through all that, we call that procrastination. Um, once we get through that, he says to Moses, uh, Moses says, but what if they don't believe me? Whoa, until now, I'll take anything. You're too old, you've got trauma, you've got, you've got a speech impediment. That's okay. What if they don't believe me? Based on what? Where's the faith? Where's the belief? You're, you're working for the big boss and you're saying, what if they don't believe me? You're just like the coolest party tricks they're going to believe you. But he says, no, what if they don't believe me? So we've got Jacob saying, well, what if half my family get killed? 
And we've got Moses saying, what if they don't believe me? What happens with Moses? They don't believe him. What happens with Jacob? I know what you want me to say. Half the family get killed, but they didn't. (laughs) Don't worry. But Jacob does get in trouble for doubting the abilities, for for questioning the process. There's an issue with his nachas and all that, not for now. One of his wives, Rochel, ends up dying on the way, but that's not from um, war. We create our own destiny. We create our own reality. There is a Yiddish phrase, tracht gut wird sein gut. If you think, as you contemplate, that it's going to be good, it will be good. It will be good. It's not a, it's not a mantra. It's not a belief. It is a fact. Not scientifically. A fact is something that's proven. You can't prove something in the future. Ah. Think good, it will be good. Ah, I know people that thought good and it wasn't good. Hey, really? You're in their head? You know that there was no slither of doubt? There was no, there was no sliver of doubt? There was, no, there was no questioning? You don't know that. Oh, but they were always positive. So they were always positive. You don't know anything. So never go, I tried being positive. I've seen other positive people fall over. You don't know nothing. As I always say to my daughter, for all you know, we're all robots and you're on this planet alone by yourself. Ta, please don't say that. (laughs) We don't know. Tracht gut fett sein gut. Think positively and it will be positive. Not think. I'm not talking about the laws of attraction. Think about the diamond and the diamond will come to you. Don't think this is the definition of positive. Just think positive. I'm not alone in this world. I'm a part of a system. I'm a I'm part of the infinite. I'm a part of Hashem. I'm a part of it all. And Hashem is with me. And I've got nothing to be afraid of. I will have everything that I need every moment. I can't explain how. I don't have enough money today. Who said? You don't have enough money today for tomorrow, but tomorrow hasn't arrived. Oh, it's hard to live like that. Live like that, my friends. Live like that. Just do it with the advice of the Chavis Halavavis who says, make sure you're living within the realms of normalcy. So the realms of normalcy are the laws of nature, so to speak. The laws of nature are, you want money, get a job. You want food, buy it, make it. You've got to still operate within the rules. But once you're operating within the rules, believe that I'm operating by the rules. Hashem will bless, bless my keli. Hashem will bless my vessel. Hashem will bless my, my, my work. Hashem will bless the, my belief. So you go to work and go, today I'm going to give it all I've got. I'm going to work from 9 to 5 or 8 till 6 or 10 till 12, whatever it is, whatever your job is. So I'm going to do my best and I will get whatever it is that I need when I need it. And if you don't have what you need tomorrow, tonight, don't worry about it. Have you done everything you can? Yes. So what are you worrying about tomorrow? There's a beautiful story with the Chassid of the Baal Shem of Reperetz. Reperetz owed, um, he had to pay rent. In those days, Jews didn't really own land in, in Russia and Ukraine, these parts of the world. And he owed rent and he had no money to pay it. And he was sent a visitor. The visitor came for the Baal Shem Tov. The visitor was a person who struggled with anxiety. And uh, the Baal Shem Tov said, if you go visit Reb Peretz, you'll get over your anxiety. So he meets Reb Peretz. And Reb Peretz says, why are you here? And he says, the Baal Shem Tov sent me because I have anxiety issues. And I was told to hang around you and you're going to cure me of my anxiety. Reb Peretz says, I have no cures for anxiety. I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) You got the wrong guy. The guy says, the Baal Shem Tov sent me. I'm staying here with you. I'm going to observe the way you live life and I'm going to get over anxiety. He quickly finds out that Reperitz is living on borrowed time. The house he's living in with Reperitz and Reperitz's family is not exactly going to be his home. And he's getting anxious. Where am I going to live after Reperitz gets thrown out of his house? Reperitz gets a knock on the door one night from the local... uh, Enforcer, the original bikey gang, you owe money. And her says, I don't owe you any money. Tomorrow I owe money. At, at sundown tomorrow is when I owe the money. Right now I don't owe anyone money. 
The guy says, do you have the money? He goes, none of your business. I don't owe you any money. And the guy leaves. And our guest turns to her parents and is like, schwitzing. Do you see the size of that guy? You haven't got the money. These guys are going to beat you. You're going to be thrown out of your house. And her parents says, hey. Next morning, they wake up. They go to shul. Reparates asks people for money. I have to pay rent. Can, can, can anyone give me the money? I've got a small business. I haven't got enough money. Can anyone? And it says, sorry, Reparates, we don't have spare cash. We can't give you money. And our anxious character is following Reparates. And he's like, okay, you work. You don't have enough money. You've gone schnorring around town. No one's given you the money. The sun is doing its big thing. It's arcing through the sky. And her parents says, but I don't need the money till this afternoon. Obviously, there's more opportunity. The sun begins to set, and the guy is like going to have a heart attack. And her parents is as cool as a cucumber. And her parents says, come, we're going to repay the, the, the rent. The guy, you, you haven't got the money. He says, but I have. I have to go to the porrits. I have to go to the landlord. I have to go to the local landowner and give him the money I do have. It's the law. They're traveling. It's a few kilometers away. This guy's like, we're going, we're going into the lion's den. The sun's setting. This guy hasn't got the money. As they are on the main road where they will turn to go to the, the, the owner's house, his, 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 wherever he is, a wagon stops and a man says, Reparates, you have a vineyard, am I correct? Reparates says, yeah. He goes, and you have these particular grapes, am I correct? He says, yeah. He says, Reparates, I am a wine merchant and I've discovered a new way of making wine and I want your grapes. He says, sure, but it's winter, I have no grapes. He goes, I want to buy summer and next summer's amount of grapes from you right now. I will give you the money right here, right now, if you agree to the price that I'm offering. No worries. Reparates does the deal. He goes, he pays his rent, and our anxious character learns his lesson. He did everything he could. So why does he have to be anxious? He doesn't run the world. There is, a, there is a system to the world. There is the infinite. There is a Hashem. There is Bitochen. What Jacob and Moshe both failed was in their test of Bitochen. What if they don't believe me? What if my family gets killed? Now, the reason why Jacob didn't get punished is because it was logical to try to save his family. However, because he is Jacob and he should have more faith, he got a little punishment. Don't worry about that. What we're talking about is that to lack in faith is very easy. And often people lack in faith because they're lazy. It's because it's like people that want to buy the lottery ticket and say, you see, God didn't give it to me. I'm not a millionaire. Why? Because I didn't win the lottery. Now, you're not a millionaire because you haven't done the normal steps to becoming a millionaire. The lottery is not a normal thing. The, the Chayva Salavava says you have to do what is the rule of society. Get a job. Not, not play the pokies. That's, you can't say, I did what normal people... It's not. Hashem blesses those that created Kaylee. So, if you're living with regret of the past, I've done bad things, therefore I've got karma, dissolve the karma. Let's say you haven't dissolved the karma because you haven't got this ability to go through transformational change. Ah, oh, so that means your future is going to be bad. Track good, vet zang good. Just because you've done bad things in the past does not mean that, you, that, that, that you're going to have a bad future. Further, do we want to right wrongs with other people because it will make us feel good or do we want to right wrongs with other people because it's good for them? If it's because it's good for them, then go and right the wrong. What if they've passed away? They don't bear a grudge. They don't bear a grudge. Once a person dies, they've got bigger fish to fry than, than, than the petty things of this world. Petty comparatively to the infinite. To the, to the place of enlightenment that we go after, after death. So, so what are we dwelling on it? What are we dwelling on the things that we can't change? The only thing we should be bothered by is how could I have come to do something wrong and change it within? 
And then King David says, I will get my chance. King David saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof. We all know this story. There was a, it was a Caroline Brooks that just wrote the book. Who is some historical novelist? Ger- Geraldine Brooks wrote the book. What was it called? David or David? I don't recommend it. It's not histor- historically accurate. It's a historical novel. But apparently it's a very good book. <laughs> if you want to read the real story, just open a Bible. So the story is he sees this beautiful girl bathing or, or listen to Leonard Cohen. <laughs> he sees a beautiful girl bathing on the roof. Sees her, says, yeah, not bad. Turns out. Her husband is a general in his army. So King David sends the general to the battlefront and he gets killed. Nebuch, there's a widow. He takes her on. Such a Rachmanis case. So he marries the the widow. What he did wasn't actually wrong according to the law necessarily. But what he did was wrong. And Hashem didn't like it. You don't have to, "Eh, but it's legal. Hashem doesn't always like the law. Likes the spirit as well. And King David suffers as a result of this behavior. He suffers not only in life, but he suffers within himself. How could I? How could I have behaved in such a, such a hedonistic, terrible way to the point that I had a soldier killed on the battlefront? All for what? For my lust of a woman. And, it, and he begged for the opportunity to be able to rectify his wrong. Can't bring the dead back to life. But he never asked to. He didn't, he didn't go to the witches and say, can you bring the dead back to life? He didn't even daven for a miracle. All he asked was for the opportunity to rectify the wrong. And that opportunity comes later in life. And of course, you've got to understand this in, context, in biblical context of the time. It says that King David was growing old and he was very, very cold and he didn't have good circulation and and he was cold at night and so they brought him a young girl to warm his bed. That's how it was back then. They brought a young girl to warm his bed. Well, and that's why we call them Linda. (laughs) Boom, boom. Um... And they bring this young girl and she warms his bed. And the posuk says, and he didn't know her. Now, we're not talking about, he was like, who's your, who's your family? No, it wasn't that. It was he didn't biblically know her. There were no relations. She warms his bed. He has nothing to do with her. She is a young, she's a young maiden, a, 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 a fair woman. And he's not going to... Um, capitalize on the fact that he's a king and that he can do, that, do what he wants and no one's going to get in his way. And this was his chuva, to be able to relive a situation of where he was confronted with, with physical beauty, where he, where he was challenged with the lust of, of the biblical man and he controls himself. He doesn't get to fix Bathsheba, doesn't get to fix her family, he gets to fix himself. So we will always be presented with the opportunity to change within ourselves. We will always get the opportunity. It won't look the same as when we did something wrong, but it will have the same narrative. And then we will create a positive energy in our reality. Why are we talking about this before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? Is because Yom Kippur is when we tap our heart, our chet, our chet, our chet, our chet. I'm sorry for what I've done. It's not about confessing. It's about searching for the potential to do wrong within ourself and removing it. It's about not having a guilty festival. It's about tapping into guilt so that we have regret, so that we have change. It's about changing what we can and not dwelling on what we can't. It's about accepting that now that it has happened, it has happened. What am I to learn from it? In what way am I to change it? It is not to be living in fear of karma, but rather changing the energy by transformation until the energy no longer exists. And so anything, that neg- anything negative that happens in our life should be a catalyst for good indirectly. And what does it say ultimately in the Mishnah and in the Talmud and in Kabbalah and pretty much everywhere? In the book of Tanya, it's really like hammered home. And when the Balchuvah truly does this, when a person truly goes through this transformation, then the negatives become positives. 
all the negatives of our past become the catalysts for good. It doesn't justify the past, but the negatives get transformed into the good that, that they are now. As the water has become a part of the shield, it has gone from being klipas negative water into part of the consciousness of, of learning. And that is why we're doing this before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I wish everyone lots of luck in getting over their guilt and acting on it with a framework for the future of personal growth development and eradicating negativity within us and with that bringing happiness to all those around us. Thank you. I'll take a couple questions, literally a couple, one in the back and two. We'll take one and, and Ashley or two. Danielle. I think tonight we're focused so much on making positive changes in ourselves so that in the future we act differently, which I think is, is half of the equation. Yeah. But I don't think we've really, we've really touched on the other half, which is as much as we can't go back and change what we've done, we can... We can apologize, so I'll just stand up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, for example, with Batsheva, even, we talked about, like, he, he made a change in the future and didn't do the same thing again, which is, which is wonderful, but we didn't really talk about the opportunity that he had to go and apologize to Batsheva and confess what he'd done and actually, in that way, maybe atone for something. All right, so you're 100% right, we didn't. Um, just a silly assumption on my part that when I referenced something earlier, I thought it would be understood. And that is, you can't work on yourself without first doing the apology to the other. <laughs> There's none of this like, I, I wronged you, I'm a better person, I've gone to the mountains. If, there has to first be the three times asking for forgiveness. Only after that, either getting the forgiveness or doing the three times, only after that can you begin working on yourself. Or in the process of the forgiveness, you work on yourself. But you're 100% right. To live in a, in a silo of, I did bad things, but I'm a better person for it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What if they did, Menachem? How can they forgive um, So there is still a process of forgiveness, which is why we go to the graves of, of people. Um, but remember, ultimately, forgiveness is not hard. And getting forgiveness is not hard. In that if you come with absolute sincerity and transformation of self, you're going to come to the person a very different person than the one who... It's like what's always interesting about the court system is that they want to see remorse. Remorse! Remorse isn't going to change anything. But remorse, when there's no remorse, it makes victims rage. That this person sat there with such... There's so many words. They sat there with such a... No, I want stronger than that. But yes, what they want is remorse because remorse is already the change within self and then when you come with remorse, the other one is able to say, I relate to this new version of you. Yes, I forgive you. If they don't sense the remorse or they don't feel that the tshuva has been adequate and it's their call to decide if it's adequate, they don't have to forgive. The person is dead. So, you know, like how can, how can if you offended someone who is now dead, yeah. Surely you can't get forgiveness from their wife, brother, sister, uncle. Correct. Because you haven't offended them. Correct. You've offended the person Correct. Which is the famous, which is the famous answer as to why we can't forgive the Germans for what they did, because they didn't do it to us. And even if they did it to me, they, I can't forgive on uh, someone else's behalf. And that's right. And that's why they don't, they don't have to forgive because it's not theirs to forgive. And, you'll have to, and we'll have to live with that. But from the dead we can because the transformation is within the soul and within the self. And the soul of the dead will, will be aware of that change. So, so, and the way it works is you go to the grave. You literally you go to the grave. You just don't do it three times because you're not getting much feedback. But you go to the grave and you say, uh, with absolute hachnoa, which is um, with a bowed head. It's not just a physical posture, but you come with this absolute... Um, regret and the transformation and you and you verbally ask for forgiveness and you apologize you confess your sin as in you say i did this and i regret it and these are the changes and with that you move on hoping that they have hoping that that, that the soul will release you yeah asha we're still coming to your second to you Sorry, one, the question and sure. one uh, <coughs> observation uh, is uh, remorse uh, is guilt a necessary prerequisite for there to be remorse? Can there be remorse without guilt? That's just a question. It wasn't made clear. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, because the remorse is that feeling. It's the charotas that were... Yeah, yeah. Okay. There can be guilt without remorse, but not vice versa. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the question is, I think, it seems to me that your discussion of divine providence seemed to completely throw the concept of th free will out the window. <laughs> what happened, happened yeah, it was meant to happen, and it was meant to happen at that time. Yes. This is a long discussion. I understand yes. that. When it, uh, free will and determinism in Judaism. Yes. And it is free will. Yes. But you seem, your definition and discussion seem to throw it out the window. There is both free will and predeterminism at the same time. Predetermination. Or predetermination. Um, I'll, I'll say it very simply, which probably won't do it justice because it really deserves its own shiur. Yes. From my vantage point, there is free will. From the vantage point of the infinite, everything is determined. So... It was always going to happen. The question, but it's like, if I know that you love um, oranges and I put oranges in front of you, I know you're going to eat it. But that doesn't change your relationship with the orange or, or your decision in the moment. So the predetermined is that Hashem has, has, a, has, has a plan. But it doesn't matter to me because I don't really have an awareness of Hashem nor the plan. So I still have to make a choice in this moment as far as I'm concerned. Asher. Uh, I'd probably be going... What this man has said, I was... George. I was, George. What George was saying about, about free will, I basically wanted to just ask pretty much for it to sum up what you were saying. Because in terms of talking about divine providence, you mentioned divine providence, acceptance, and creation of destiny. And yeah. What I take from those when we already, I feel like, it, well, what I've taken from that is that although that there is the, the, the divine order, that when we accept it, when we, we don't need to understand it, we don't need to understand how lives are in kind of, it's beyond us. It's not going to really make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, what, we correct, have, correct. what we have is what we have here. Correct. In this moment, and the choice to create our destiny Excellent. by choosing how we relate and how we hold on to guilt, remorse, regret. How yeah. we choose to, if we choose to forgive ourselves, if we choose to make decisions to move forward, bring positive energy, yeah. then we change our destiny in, in the next moment, the moment, without thinking about the future, without thinking about the next life, without thinking about repercussions. It's just... How do we harbor a destiny filled with positivity, connection, and openness? Yes. So yeah, I mean, basically that's what I was just yes. asking for, for, for. A, a validation? A, yeah. A, well, not a validation, more just a, a summary of it because it's about creating our destiny. But destiny can be this grandiose, like, broad mystical notion, or it can just be yes. the destiny of what we are creating, what we're contributing. To the I world. like it. It's good. The, the free choice is a very small thing, as you've said. It is my choice in how I will respond based on the fact that I don't actually know what's going on. That's the free choice. To the consciousness of all, it's like Google has all the results before you've even started typing. But as far as I'm concerned, if I want to find a result, I need to start typing. So I write, how do you, and the algorithm keeps coming up with what the end of the sentence is. But before I even started typing, Google itself had all the algorithms and had all the knowledge. So wherever it goes, Google knows it was going to go. Google knows all the things. Now move a step further. Imagine Google, well now we're talking about Hashem, knows what you're going to type. But that makes no difference to you and me. Its knowledge is outside of my experience. We're going to revisit this in the future. It's preordained that we will. I want to wish everyone, um, just before we break up, a Shana Tova. And what that means is to have a good year and that if you have done things wrong, know that you can create positive futures. If you have things with, with people who have passed on, it doesn't mean you can't rectify and create nachas for them. And that's all I really wanted everyone to get out of tonight's class, that, that, that positivity lies ahead despite negativity. 
and accept and, and, and move beyond and go through the growth process that negative um, opportunities afford us. Thank you so much. Thank you.